Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test Tube Plus again today for episode two of five on flight. Yesterday we talked about how airplanes harness physics to actually fly, but then we left it kind of with what happens then. How do you take all of this stuff and do something with it, right? So we need to talk about what happened to create the airplane. No one really questions that the Wright brothers invented the airplane, or so you think. There actually are people who used to question it. There are a few different claims that people make to say that different figures in history and different places may have beat the Wright brothers or may have been the first people to fly, etc. You know, Ohio brags about it on their license plate. North Carolina uh, argues that they were the first ones. They're both right, sort of. Both wrong, sort of. Wright brothers were not the first ones to fly, though. They were the first ones to do it in an airplane. <laughs> On December 17th, 1903, the two brothers flew in an airplane for test flights in the Wright Flyer in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, but they were from Ohio. So yeah, North Carolina, you got the first flight, but the dudes weren't from there. They didn't invent it there, they just, moved, they just went over there to fly it. The first flight ever was done by Orville Wright. It lasted 12 seconds and they flew only about 120 feet. They did better in the second flight and the third flight. By the fourth flight, Wilbur flew, lasted for 59 seconds, and flew around 852 feet, which must have felt incredible, right? Of course, then it got a little windy, it blew their flying machine over and basically destroyed it. But they had gotten what they wanted, they'd made their flights. But why are these ones the first flights? The reason is they had an airplane by definition. And by definition, an airplane has a few characteristics. First, it's heavier than air. Second, it must be manned and powered. So lots of people before, during, and after the Wright brothers in the early 1900s, they'd been flying all sorts of stuff. Gliders, hot air balloons, very common before that. But they're not technically airplanes, right? One could argue that a hot air balloon during the Civil War, I mean, they were flying, right? Second, that aircraft must be manned and powered. The engine must be attached to the flying contraption. So we've got propellers, we've got jet propulsion now. You know, both of those count. I mean, there might even be something else we haven't figured out yet. You know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <coughs> Episode five, don't worry, come back to that. Some will take it even a few steps further and say that an airplane must be able to take off and land under its own power. And this one is super cool and a little confusing. The airplane must be controllable along three axes, roll, pitch, and yaw. Things that you maybe have heard, they're technical terms. Roll is the movement of side to side. Think the wings kind of going up and down on each side. Pitch is front to back, so think the nose of the airplane going up and down and the tail moving. Yaw is like spinning like a top. It's kind of the confusing one. So think about it this way. You put a plate flat on a table, and then you turn it left and right while it's flat on the table, that's yaw. The construction of the right flyer was the first flying machine to do all of these things. It was powered, it was manned, it could take off and land under its own power, it had all these different controls, it wasn't just floating up in the air. One of the main arguments for someone other than the Wright brothers being first in flight was Gustav A. Whitehead. There are claims that he flew a powered, controlled airplane two years even before Orville and Wilbur had done it, but a June 2014 paper, it took kind of a while, over 100 years, published in the Royal Aeronautical Society finally debunked that whole claim. But once the Wright brothers had taken this airplane, right, they'd flown it in Kitty Hawk, they went back to Ohio, started working on more designs. What did people do with that knowledge? What happened then? Because once a good design comes along, you know, capitalism, baby. In France, Brazilian-born balloonist Alberto Santos Dumont began to experiment with his own airplane designs. He built and flew an airplane called the 14 Bis. It looked like a giant box kite, pretty much. It won the Deutsche Arkdeken Prize for the first public, heavier-than-air powered flight in Europe. On February 1st of 1908, the Wright brothers took their first passenger, Charles Furness, on a flight, and this was sort of, kind of, the beginning of commercial aviation. The first real scheduled commercial airline flight was actually a half dozen years later in 1914, when 25-year-old test pilot Tony Janus flew Thomas Benoit's designed flying boat number 43 for 23 minutes 
from St. Petersburg, Florida to Tampa, Florida. Never thought I'd say this on Test 2 Plus, but way to go, Florida! Woo! <laughs> Janice's one paying passenger was Abram Fell. He was the mayor of St. Petersburg, and he paid $400. When calculated for inflation, that's almost 10 grand. This actually became the very first scheduled passenger airline service, and it was known as the Petersburg Tampa Airboat Line. It only lasted for four months, though. So. so after Janice's inaugural passenger trip, they obviously caught on. Many, many more. Again, capitalism, baby. Found their way into planes in February of 1915 at the Panama Pacific International Exposition in San Francisco. What, what? San Franciscan Alan Lougheed obtained authorization to launch a flight service across San Francisco Bay. He gave about 600 paid passengers rides over the bay over about 50 days. Then in 1918, the United States set up its first airmail service. A federal government looked after it, and it wasn't until about 1925 that flying was safe enough that Congress passed the first Airmail Act, also known as the Kelly Act, and it was the first legislation that directly affected the now young aviation industry. Basically, it allowed the Postmaster General to contract domestic airmail service with commercial air carriers. It's like a government contractor service for the mail. This bit of legislation had all of the wealthy bigwigs investing in commercial aviation to try and get some of that gummit money. And small airlines were popping up all over. And in 1926, Congress passed the Air Commerce Act. And this baby produced regulations that the airline industry would have to adhere to in order to operate. For the first time, pilots would have to pass tests. Probably a good thing. Planes would need inspections to receive certificates of airworthiness. Also probably pretty good. Air traffic control rules were introduced. So you couldn't just fly around up there without anybody watching. The thing is, then they had to decide how that worked, right? Who would decide how air traffic controlling worked? What about airports and radars and all sorts of stuff? And that's the pretty great history of airplanes, you know, and the airline industry. Thanks a lot to Boeing for helping to make this episode possible. Boeing, building the future one century at a time. Guys, if you want to fly a historical airplane, you know, like Microsoft Flight Simulator, whatever, I did one a World War II plane once, it was super cool. Let us know down in the comments if uh, you have any planes that you like. And also, keep coming back here to Test 2 Plus every day for more videos. We've got uh, three more videos coming at you about flight, so make sure you subscribe for those. We'll see you next time.